So welcome everybody and each of you. I learned that um, a while ago that, well, that we can be seen in the collective as well as individual. So welcome to, Thanks. to all of you and each of you. I'm so glad that you are choosing to spend some time with us today at, um, spend some time as us as leadership, that you're willing to spend some time with us and learn from um, our speaker today. There are a few uh, leadership opening things that we want to do before we hand it off to Molly. One of that, one of those things is um, my name is Tanya Williams and I use they and she pronouns and I am the curriculum and uh, training specialist at Leadership um, and absolutely love the organization and my colleagues. Um, Abby, I'm going to wait on you since you're going to get a chance to yeah. introduce yourself later. Uh, but want to just move us through some opening slides uh, and again, thank the people who are coming on for the session today. So uh, what we're going to do uh, for this session today, um, it's going to be a little bit like a webinar in that uh, we really would love a active chat and your questions and your comments are absolutely welcomed by chat. Um, we will have some polls, though they won't be Zoom polls. We'll be doing those through Mentimeter. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity for engagement for you. Um, though we won't be coming off of, um, uh, we won't be engaging by voice. I'll say that uh, because we want to get as many responses to questions and comments and things in as possible and let Molly have the time to really share. If you have a question um, for me as the moderator that you don't want to share, Zoom has this really handy direct message that you can just send uh, me a direct message and I can um, anonymously share your question uh, in the room. And as, that, as I said, we're not really having you come off of microphone, um, but lots and lots of engagement in the chat would be fantastic. And connected to engagement, uh, we offer this land acknowledgement and it feels important. Um, like land acknowledgements in the United States, I think are becoming, and thankfully so, um, more, um, more commonplace and the commonplaceness of them doesn't have to be, um, like just ritual and uh, like we do it because it's kind of, you know, a checkbox. We at Leadership really want us to be reflective about um, the land, not only that we're on, but the people uh, and indigenous identities uh, that regard, like resided on the land long before um, what, how the world has shown up at this point and are still here. Um, and so I'm going to read this, and I invite you to really reflect where are you right now? What is your relationship to the people? But also, what is your relationship to the land? What is your relationship to the water? What is your relationship to the earth? And um, to really hold that land acknowledgments aren't a checkbox. They're not a, okay, this is our chance just to remember indigenous populations. It is absolutely connected to the values and beliefs and principles um, of social identity, you know, indigenous folks, but also our own relationship to the land and all that there is. So leadership would like to begin this presentation by acknowledging that the land that each of us is on today is the original homeland of indigenous and tribal nations. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from these territories, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples and cultures still connected to this land. Please honor and acknowledge the native and indigenous peoples from the land that you are joining us from, and give thought to your ancestry and the generations that came before you. And so it's that recognition that we can go back 
and we can go forward. We are only in, uh, we have impact for this present time. And so how do we hold that more deeply? Lastly, our vision and mission at Leadership, and you, you might be a returner, and so you've, you've heard these before, or you might be new to Leadership, and we always want people to understand why we are doing what we do. Our vision is a just, caring, and thriving world where all lead with integrity and have a healthy disregard for the impossible. Our mission is to transform the world by increasing the number of people who lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible. And so that's why we do any of the things that we do. And we do a lot of stuff. And I'm going to come back later um, when Molly has, has taken us through all of this great brilliance uh, and tell you a little bit more about our programming. Um, but right now, I actually want to invite you into one thing before I hand it off to Molly. And that is introductions. And so in the chat, if you would be willing, as Abby has, has offered, in the chat. Thank you, Abby. Please introduce yourself, um, share your name, pronoun usage if you're comfortable, and where you might be joining us from the from today. So if we can start putting that in as I hand it off to Molly, welcome. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tanya. And so great to see folks in the chat. Welcome, everyone. I love that we have a variety of places across the country. And I will share my slides. Okay. Today, I will be sharing the power of partners, an innovative approach to scaffolding connection for well being and racial justice through Cojourn. Um, so much gratitude to Abby and Tanya for inviting me and the rest of the folks at Leadership to get a chance to share a little bit. And thank you all for being here today. Before we dive in, um, we have a um, a practice of always starting any Cojourn related presentations, workshops, sessions with just a chance to take a couple of breaths <laughs> together to ground, um, to let go of maybe where we're coming from or to fully arrive. I know Tanya did such a beautiful job of bringing us in, but um, if it feels generative for you, you can close your eyes or you can just soften your gaze. And if you would like to join me and just three deep, slow, collective breaths. You can notice what it feels like to be in your body in this moment. So we take one more collective breath. I'll invite you to set an intention for the short time together today, whether it's openness, possibility, self-compassion, and then breathe out whatever doesn't serve you for this short time together. Thank you. So a quick introduction of who I am. Uh, my name is Molly Keen. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I am here as the co-founder of Cojourn. My other co-founder, Carl Henriksen, is actually on the um, call today, which is really exciting, um, as well as our one of our other co-leaders, Angelica Castro, is here as well. So shout out to the two of them. I also teach at Mount Holyoke College. I'm a visitor, le visiting lecturer in intergroup dialogue, I'm really doing a lot of work around co-facilitating uh, dialogues on race and racism, and then training students how to facilitate. Um, I am a graduate of the Social Justice Education Doctoral Program at UMass Amherst, along with Tanya Williams, which um, really is a foundation of all of the work that I do. I identify as a connector, um, social justice educator, entrepreneur, pug enthusiast, and the pugs always make an appearance on at least one slide, accordionist, swimmer, runner, bingo caller, and eternal optimist. Um, and I know leadership is really values driven. And so, you know, some of my core values are connection, joy, equity, creativity, and integrity. So I'm going to take a moment now um, to um, give the floor to Tanya and Abby for a chance to introduce themselves and say something about their, who they are in terms of leadership and also their connection to Cojourn, which I'll be talking about for the rest of the time today. Awesome. I see Tanya pointing at me, which I know means you're up. Abby, you go first. So <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Abby Prince Atwood. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of campus growth at Leadership, which means that I'm 
um, forging partnerships with campuses that we haven't connected with yet, which um, lines up with a lot of my values, which is um, just a lot of hope and joy really in seeing what could be possible. Um, and so part of that too, you see me in this picture here. I don't know if you can tell what that little fluff ball is that I'm holding, but it's a, um, a little puppy that I'm fostering right now. And he brings a lot of joy um, and hope into our household, which I'm really excited to see what happens next for him, which is really cool. Um, and I got connected with Cojern last year at NASPA, um, the annual conference. Um, it was in Baltimore last year. Tanya had talked at length about Cojern and sort of like dropped in little nuggets of her Cojern experience and then encouraged me to go over to the Cojern table to meet Molly. And I was so glad that I did. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about my Cojern experience since then. Um, but Tanya, if you'd like to reintroduce yourself perhaps in that context to you. Sure thing. Um, so again, Tanya, uh, they and she pronouns, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. And um, I, at leadership, Curriculum training. Uh, again, love the organization and, and want to give in any way that I can. Um, and my connection to Cojern, I, I like to. I I will say that I'm an early adopter. Um, I can remember standing when I moved to to New York City. I can remember standing in the kitchen of the apartment that I uh, moved to, and as I left Western Mass, and so I'd known Molly in grad school. Um, I can remember Molly telling me about it and, and like my eyes lighting up and going, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. And then having gotten to um, have two uh, cojern partners, um, one of which has been Molly, um, it, it, it truly life, it, transformational in my life of getting to um, really do this work in, in relationship. And so the work that I wanted to do in relationship, the relationship made the difference. So excited to talk more about that. And Molly, I'll hand it back to you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, so I wanted to start with a pulse of the room. And I want to thank Abby for this. Abby was pointing out that we're in higher ed. A lot of the folks here are from higher ed and, and some student affairs. It's the end of April, um, but wanted to hear how people are doing. So we're gonna invite you to do a Mentimeter in one word. How are you feeling right now in your relation to your work? You can put up to three words if you'd like to. And if you can use the QR code, um, if you have another device or go to menti.com and enter the code 3836411. Six, three. And um, we'll just get a quick word cloud to, to get a sense of where people are at. I'll leave this up for just another second. But, and then the code will be there as well on the word cloud. So let's see, move over. Okay, we have, oh, I love this. Hopeful, tired, overwhelmed, energized, a bit unfocused, uncertain, stressed, challenged, finding purpose running on empathy. So it looks like people are coming in today in a, from a variety of different places. Um, I appreciate that the biggest word, which means the most answered is hopeful um, and also tired, <laughs> which um, was one of the words that I had. <laughs> and I have um, just a couple more. Um, we, we have a couple in the chat. Grateful, spring, and love. So we're going to do one other quick self-reflection. Um, this one is going to be an internal um, moment for you all. You, so you don't need, won't be putting this into the mentee. But I'm going to invite you to take a second and think about the last week. And think of one thing, large or small, that you can celebrate yourself for in your professional life. So I had shared with Abby and Tanya ahead of time, I'm celebrating myself because I have three Cojern presentations in a couple of days. And last night I was feeling that overwhelm and um, the need to over-prepare based in my anxiety. And I felt myself spinning and I overrode that 
And instead of rereading this paper on graduate student mental health <laughs> that I'd already read, probably didn't even need to read to prepare, I went over to have dinner with um, my friends Amanda and Eliza and their kids. And then we watched the new episode of Ted Lasso. And I went to bed early and I woke up today and my mind was working again and I was grounded. It was just what I knew that I needed in that moment. So that's an example of something to celebrate. Um, it could be making it here today, a good conversation with a student. And so um, I'll watch the time and we'll just take like 20 seconds. You can write it down if you want to. If you would like to share it with the group, we welcome it in the chat, but no need. Okay, thank you. And oh, Tanya shared, I celebrated me through two weeks of travel for work and I feel physically good, amazing. Moving my department forward in Jedi work when it felt hopeless just a few months ago. Wonderful, congratulations. And we're gonna be coming back to these. So if you wrote them down or you wrote them, wrote them in the chat, I'm gonna invite you to hold on that, but thank you for putting your attention on that. And I'll share more a little bit about that later. I'm gonna to continue to talk a little bit about what is CODRM, this thing that we're referring to. Um, so it's short definition is a research-backed framework for compassionate, judgment-free accountability partnerships. It's designed to offer more connection and mutual support as we strive to create meaningful movement in our lives. This is a picture of um, some of the CODRM team, including um, Tanya when we were at, and then Helica when we were at um, the NASPA National Conference last year. And Cojourn is based in two pillars, um, the idea of authentic connection and trying to recreate opportunities and methods for human connection and sustainable follow through. So both realistic and sustainable approaches to follow through on different goals and intentions. And we say, you know, connection and sustainable follow through, through equals together help. Um, and we talk about together help in contrast to individualistic self-help. And really it's about doing this work in partnership. And our pro program's mission is to try to um, counter increasing disconnection we experience in the fast-paced technology-driven society and also have an accessible tool to help with follow-through on an intention over time. So Cojourn's intentionally um, simple to follow, but very so some of those simple pieces are some I think of the most as the most difficult and really lifelong work, you know, diving into things like self-compassion, deep listening. But we really tried to create it um, in an accessible way that most anybody can um, access the program in different ways. And just a quick snapshot of how it works. So you find an accountability partner and you know you find someone that you want to pair up with or in our organizational programs, we pair people if they would like to be paired. And then you create an intention, a guiding theme, an area that you want to pay attention to over time and that would be generative for you and your life. And then you make a commitment for a set period of time. We created it to be a year, and now we're working with 12-week periods with most of our programs. And so you're really making this commitment to work on an area of your life um, for this set period of time, both for yourself but and also for your accountability partner. And then you apply the formula, and we'll share a little bit more about that later, but they're the eight core components of Cojourn that are based in evidence-based practices that um, make it work, make it sustainable, make it possible. Things like I mentioned, like um, having self-compassion as you move through, working on non-judgment, um, celebrating small wins. And then each week you create approximately three to five weekly milestones. So goals or mini intention that move you forward on that path that you set. And then you reflect and repeat. And um, we believe that, th that these aspects are what make Cojourn work and help move people forward in different ways um, in contrast to more um, casual accountability partnerships that may fizzle out. And brief 
history. Um, so we, this is a picture of Carl and I, um, and the left, we had been bandmates. I was the accordion player and he was the lead singer and guitarist. Um, and this is us on the right just this past summer. Um, but we created Cojourn out of a time of need in our own lives. This is about a decade ago. I was five years into my doctoral program in social justice education, just starting to write my dissertation and really became um, overwhelmed with anxiety um, and balancing too much and really was contemplating dropping out. And I was seeing a therapist and I knew what I needed to do to get myself back on track um, physiologically and with my mental health, but I was, dry, I was not able to get myself to actually do it. And so um, Carl was going through some of his own um, life journeys at that time. And we really decided to partner and put these parameters in place based on some work we had been doing in mindfulness, my own doctoral research on the power of connection and, um, and other pieces and kind of did it um, to experiment on ourselves for a year. And that first year I worked on quieting myself. So things like developing a regular meditation practice, slowing down, um, really get, getting back in tune with myself. And I really attribute that experience to the reason I was able to get back on track and finish and graduate the following year. And so we were really diving into some of the work around connection and the impact of changes in technology on connection, drawing some on Brene Brown's work. I love this quote, connection is why we're here. It's what gives purpose to our lives. It's how we're neurobiologically wired. And, you know, thinking about the, um, the um, plague of loneliness, you know, this is a cover of Time, Time magazine, but, um, you know, it's being labeled a public health crisis. And, you know, I imagine people, some people might be familiar with some of the statistics. Um, just in 2022, there was a Cigna study that came out and it was up to um, three in five Americans reported loneliness. So 68%. And that number was close to 80% for 18 to 24 year olds. Up from 1980, it was a 20%. Um, of Americans reported loneliness. And it was just under 50% in 2018. So we can see it's really skyrocketed. And so, you know, Cojourn was created as a way to um, talk with somebody and build one more connection in our lives. Um, and then it was also based in, you know, I love this slide, the magic of accountability. And I, I imagine and feel free to put in the chat if you have experiences with the magic of accountability in your life. But this is looking at what the literature calls legitimate accountability, which is being accountable to someone you're choosing for some area that you would like to be held accountable for. One research study showed that if we if we tell someone we're going to do something and we follow up with them and write it down, we're 76 percent likely to to follow through, as opposed to only 35% if we don't have that accountability mechanism in place. And so we, you know, got into that. And as I mentioned, I worked on quieting myself and really um, engaging with some of those goals around slowing down, turning off my phone for periods of time. And then we started after that first year telling friends and family, and then more people started doing it, and then more people started doing it. And we're now in 40 eight countries and 43 states. Um, we have a variety of organizational programs and other people have really seen and mirrored the benefits of that connection and chance for regular sustainable follow through over time. In 2019, we released our book about the program and the book include 10 guest contributors, all of whom who shared how they use the program. This is a picture with three of the book contributors um, at the NASPA conference. And some of the things other people worked on, these folks all um, are in the book and work in higher ed, healthy living, cultivating healthy relationships, full, going full throttle, you know, moving forward even when scared or overwhelmed or being a consistent finisher. And so since we have two um, folks in the room who um, Tanya are co-presenting, Tanya and Abby, both of whom who have direct experience with Cojourn, I'm going to invite them in to share a little bit of more about their own experiences or any reflections on anything that I just shared. My apologies. Um, I couldn't find my cursor. Um, I saw the, the handoff, Abby, so thank you for that. Um, I think the thing that I, well, 
what I'll share is, um, Molly, thank you for like re, um, re-educating and continuing to like uh, feed into and help me remember the power of Cojourn um, and, and to recall my experiences. Um, it's been a few years since I uh, ha have been in a Cojourn partnership and I immediately just thought like, oh, it's time. It's time for me to, to you know, dig back in because there are things in my life that I've in some ways been stalled on. Um, and wow, when I think about the experiences that I had when I was um, uh, in partnering in coach or in partnership, uh, when I think about those years, cause I did uh, essentially two year long experiences uh, with two different people, um, the growth, for me was exponential and, and I tried some things that were edge pushing for me. Um, and it really ever, it really never was about, and this is, I love what you're saying, Molly, around um, like the intentional partnership and the intentional accountability. It never was, it helped me recognize that I didn't, I built a relationship with with each of the people in such a way that it, I knew that when I came to my cojourn meetings with my partner, it was never about like, I didn't have to carry shame with me if I didn't do something. I could carry curiosity with me into that conversation and kind of, you know, report like this goal or these, um, these focus, the focus that I, I wanted to have for the week. I wasn't able to do and and like let me think with you a little bit about why that didn't happen um and so where shame i think sometimes gets in front of us and it's like okay i'm gonna be shown how um not capable i am or you know i, I gotta apologize it's like oh no, you just have a partner who is willing and wanting to be on this ride of your life with you. Um, and so I, I will say, I, I love this as a, a story that one of my uh, co-journ partners, um, we were both working on, I think, relationship stuff um, and just really being in relationships and being, being aware and conscious and, and intentional about relationships. And, uh, we both ended up in relationships um, during that year. Uh, she got married. I got to uh, officiate her wedding and um, I did not get married. And I learned tons. I, I ended up in a really great relationship, but I, I learned tons about myself through that process. But I, I love that that was one of the outcomes. Um, but then I also have worked on, you know, uh, extending my uh, want for an awareness of my own desire. Uh, and that was a wonderful adventure um, for the year and, and with that co co partner. So kind of all over the place and we never have to be alone. And I think co has taught me that. Abby? Yeah, I love that, Tanya. I think that, um, Tanya, this is something you talk about so well, I think is um, not being alone and who we are in community. And I think Cojourn talks about this so well too. And I love that the tagline of this session is the power of partners because the way in which we partner with that person throughout, um, in my case and in Tanya's as well, a year long Cojourn partnership um, and thinking about who are you with that person and how are they helping you to encourage and to celebrate and to um, watch you grow and encourage you to grow in that time. Um, I was just reading about, well, I was not reading a study. I was reading a headline in a first paragraph of a study. I want to be super clear about that, but um, Harvard just did a study around loneliness and connection and saying that like, if you had to choose between smoking or being alone, it was a healthier choice to choose smoking. Let that settle in, right? <laughs> So having partnership, having connection, having humans, having people that 
that do exactly what Cojern is teaching us to do and to do well is super important. And I'm so glad. Um, I, when I was first reading about Cojern, and again, it was just showing up at the NASPA booth, talking with Molly and um, Angelica and just thinking about like, is this something I could do? Like it felt so, it felt like a great big hope to commit to it. And then Molly um, gifted me this Cojern book to read about and to learn about a little more. And that just felt even more so of this like, take a chance on this and see what you can do with this, see what you can make of this for yourself. And I'm so glad I did. Um, and I didn't have a partner. So in reading about the book, they um, talk, uh, Molly and um, Carl explained so well around like how you choose your cojourn partner for this experience. And I was like, oh, I was getting all hung up and twisty about like, who would I pick? Who would I ask to do this? And then I see the message that says, or cojourn can partner you with someone. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to see who the cojourn universe gifts me for this experience. I'm so glad I did this because my cojourn partner, we just have a lot of things in common and we support each other in these ways that I don't know what it would feel like for me if it was a different person. And right now I don't have to learn what that's like because I have this partner who's incredibly supportive um, in my cojourn goals. We meet every Monday afternoon. Um, and in that partnership, I have learned lots of great ways to be graceful with myself, which is not my strong suit. I want to be super hard on myself and super negative with myself at all times. Um, but my cojourn partner, I was thinking recently about one of our recent conversations where I was saying, because this is a lesson I'll have to learn like 85 times in my life probably, but I was being kind of mean with myself about like, oh, I didn't meet these goals and I fell so short of it and I can't believe I did this and I had to adjust to only do this thing one time this week instead of the five times that I'd planned. And, and my cojourn partner says, oh, wow, you figured out a way to adjust given all the like extraneous unplanned for things around you. Like what a gracious way to respond. And I was like, oh, I did learn that lesson. Yeah. But I had to, I had to verbalize it. I had to have the conversation in order to see that that is what I had done. And then to graciously appreciate the more positive celebratory spin on what I had taken as a negative. And so to be able to have this partnership and check in with, um, with Bronwyn, with my cojourn partner, um, every week, I even, um, we do this sometimes with each other. And just this week I did, I had a goal for our week that led to my intention that I was being a little, I just didn't want to do it. Okay. I just didn't want to. And so when we met on Monday afternoon, I said, I'm going to text you as soon as I complete this task, this goal for the week, as soon as I make movement on this goal for the week, I'm going to text you. And I just want to speak that into our coacher and partnership that that is my plan. And so when, then when I did, it was nothing but celebration and this text with my partner and being able to say like, you did it, you accomplished this thing. And being able to share that accomplishment just felt really good. And I needed the accountability to do it. And so I'm super grateful that I had that. And then I knew I could rely on her for that too. Molly, can I say one more thing? Abby, please. Mind. Yeah. Oh yeah. There is such, cause I have a lot of great relationships. Some of those, those relationships are people on this call. There is such <laughs> power um, in having someone that you may not have as close a relationship. Absolutely. It'd be great to, you know, I tried this with my best best friend didn't work. Uh, she, I tried to rope her kind of into doing Cojourn. There's something when people intentionally choose in mm -hmm. um, that is so powerful to me that, and having people that I may not know or not know as well, because one of my partners I know really well, one of my partners, I just, she works with me and I want to know her better. Um, sometimes people in our lives have too much, uh, or not, I don't want to say too much, but have such like, they're too bought in. And mm -hmm. so it's sort of, they so have some attachment to our success and some attachment to our, uh, you know, falling short. And Cojourn is so brilliant to me that I can 
builds relationships and the truth of relationships um, without all of that back, you know, uh, background and history where people mm -hmm. might have attachment to my success or, or falling short. I love listening to you both. <laughs> Thank you. Both for, I was thinking, I loved how Tanya, you brought up the experimentation and curiosity, you know, and helping us around shame. I was thinking of it. So this fall when I was teaching, I got into a really tricky situation um, of connected to two of my privileged identities related to both racism and ableism at the same time in a class. And I, I got really mired down in shame and I was mm -hmm. used my cojourn relationship to make goals each week about taking accountability for the places I needed to learn more or to move or to shift or be kind to myself for navigating a really complex situation. And it was like a three, four week, five week, you know, I read a book, I did, you know, and met with some people and I got a hand thinking through, but how important for me, those, those times when we can get stuck or um, it can be hard to move to have someone who's unconditionally cheering us on and supporting us. Um, and I also wanted to speak to Abby. I appreciated you bringing up that that Harvard study that you know that piece that you were just looking at. And I had bought um, the book "The Good Life" by um, Robert Waldinger and his group at Harvard, who did the longest longitudinal study um, in history. And they found that the number, you know, that there are all these negative health implications, like Abby said, to loneliness. But the number one predictor of well-being in life, longevity, uh, all a lot of the um, pieces, is what they call social fitness. It's having people we're connected to, who we can share about our lives with, having a confidant, having multiple confidants, prioritizing that. And I think, you know, regardless, like it's such a important reminder for all of us, you know, it's very separate from Kojur and that like taking that time, even if we're like, I'm busy, I don't have time to like have lunch with a friend and connect, go for a walk. That, that is so critical for our well-being and longevity. And for me, it's such an embodied thing that sometimes I need to do it to be re-reminded of the importance of it. So I meet with my Kojur partner Wednesdays for breakfast at 7 a.m., and sometimes I'm like, I don't have time for this. <laughs> I have all this work to do. You know, and whenever I go, I walk out like reset, regrounded, reconnected, just on a physiological, you know, way that's that um is so critical. So you both really spoke, spoke to that piece. Um, feel free, I'm going to continue um, and give you all a chance to think about, you know, I know this is often a busy time of year for people, but I think sometimes that can be the best time just to put our mind, if there's an area in your own life where you felt stuck or where you would like to make some meaningful movement or prioritize in the next set of months, I'm thinking a lot about my journey of decluttering and making my home an oasis and sanctuary for me. It's an ongoing piece. But this morning I was really thinking about that. But wanted to give you a, a chance to reflect on this. Um, I And here's some areas, not at all limited to these, but that, some, you know, that might help stress relief, um, playing more, healthy eating and drinking, social activism, connections and relationships. Um, We'll take a, a short period in silence so you can think about it and maybe jot something down. And I think we're I think we're gonna skip this second Mentimeter and just because it's a smaller group and I know a few folks weren't able to access it and just invite you to write if you would like to this one area that you've identified in the chat. You can write to me directly and I can read them or you can write to um, everybody. So one area where you'd like to make meaningful movement, I can go back to the list too, if that's helpful. It can be sometimes be helpful to hear what others are um, thinking of or working on to, you know, to get ideas. So we have connections and relationships, feeling healthy and strong in my mind and body, preparing for life after retirement priorities for the next chapter. Wonderful. I I'd like to focus on is not making all the areas my goal. That's great as well. Yes, that sounds... Um, Definitely. It's hard to narrow it down when you look at the slide, right? Like, yep, I want to do all the things. Check, check, check. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I appreciate Eric's comment. <laughs> Me too. It's the recognition of like focus and 
Um, yeah. Times it's safer to stay broad. And when we put focus, like what might be possible if we, mm -hmm. we kind of zero in. Yeah. And then Helica is saying, I love everything working on saying no thank you to people, opportunity, and shiny objects. <laughs> Decluttering as well, being a minimalist. We can join together in that. And Helica, <laughs> overcoming self doubt, career visioning. Beautiful. Thank you. We've had somebody work on playing more. And that's another one that I, I think would be in play and creativity and joy. Um, and, you know, invite you to really think there, there's power in an intention, you know, and as we said it over a period of time. Um, and so whatever you decide, even if you just write it down and have it somewhere where it's visible to you as a reminder to keep, keep that in the forefront, because sometimes it can be so easy to work with the emergencies right in front of us or the critical things that we have to address. And then sometimes our larger life dreams or the big areas where we want to move and grow or our own priorities are the things that often get set to the back burner. So it can be helpful to have that right in, right in front. And, you know, um, so I mentioned the code drone formula for success. And we, there are these eight core components, which are what we argue make this these peer accountability partnerships work. Um, and I wanted to highlight um, just a couple of them, but one is peer support. And so these are based in a relationship. It's different from peer mentoring where uh, that are often kind of hierarchical, where there's one person with more experience who kind of advises somebody else. Um, it's more joining in mutua mutuality and a chance to tune in and identify what we really need while someone else is holding space and active deep listening to us. Um, I love this quote. I always like to read this quote by um, Parker Palmer in his book, A Hidden Wholeness, connected to partner matching. Um, and he says, we all have an inner teacher whose guidance is more reliable than anything we can get from a doctrine, ideology, collective belief system, institution, or leader. We all need other people to invite, amplify, and help us discern the inner teacher's voice. And so there's a piece around, around that. Um, and then, you know, we had a couple people mention self-compassion. The goal is to not have to lie, <laughs> which I get, it can be really a temptation, at least for me and some other accountability or some other pieces where I have to, to really show up just as we are and know when we're kind to ourselves and our partner reminds us of that we're more likely to keep moving in the areas we want to. We're more likely to be able to access all of our thinking in a moment. Um, and when we're harsh with ourselves, it's actually counterproductive. But the one I really wanted to highlight today was the spirit of celebration. And, you know, I know earlier I had everyone call up one thing you can celebrate yourself for. And we got to hear a few in the chat. And, you know, the reason, and I do some work around, um, presentations on joy with a group. Um, and I often do the piece around the negativity bias and the importance of doing practices in our life to override that in different ways that really does have a physiological effect on us. Um, and so, you know, we are negative experiences have a greater impact on us than positive experiences. In fact, we need to take in and internalize positive experiences and give them at least five times more attention than the negative ones. And often people can relate with that um, negative feedback from a presentation or a course or a course eval. Like I remember for years, <laughs> that one piece of big critical feedback or the two, you know, and all the positive ones kind of just wash over me. And so there's so much importance in like pausing and taking that in a little bit. And so um, I'm going to do one quick hands-on demonstration of this. So this is how long it takes for the brain to convert a negative experience into long-term memory. I have my iPhone. I'm going to press start now. So that was it. Two seconds. This is how long it takes for the brain to convert a positive experience into our long-term memory. I'm gonna press start now. That was 16 seconds. So it's an average between um, 12 and 20. And so I picked the midpoint, but you can see it feels, and if, you know, you think my iPhone's malfunctioning, it's so long. And so that the purpose of that activity at the beginning 
is to give you a chance to savor, notice, give the brain a chance to take in that little piece. In the last couple of minutes, I'm going to mention the some of our organizational programs for Cojourn. I know I said in the program description, we would talk a little bit about that. Um, back in 2019, after the book came out, we started offering some organizational programs and how they look, um, they're 12 weeks in length. We do a group launch. So where, um, and then we offer partner matching so people can choose a partner, an accountability partner or be matched. We give some resources. We have a program guidebook, which is right here, um, and a gold tracking spreadsheets. And then it's self-directed. And each week you meet for 20 to 30 minutes with your partner. We have some large group check-ins at the midpoint and the end, and then weekly emails for tips and encouragement. And then um, in 2020, we created a work with a team of social justice educators, some of whom are pictured um, in this picture, and one includes uh, Tanya Williams and Angelica Castro. Um, we created a 12-week cojourn experience for organizations who want to help employees live into organizational justice, diversity, equity, inclusion, visions, and statements using our cojourn peer-to-peer support and accountability program. And we've worked with nonprofits, we've worked with higher ed, we worked with the NASA national NASPA organization over this past year, you know, pairing folks and really helping them hone in and zoom in on their own areas for growth, learning, and forward movement around those. And I'm currently um, I'm working on a Cojourn for Climate Action program, which is really exciting and new and collecting people who might be interested in being involved in different ways. Um, and, you know, what, one implementation was across UMass Amherst, where we over the years have worked with faculty and staff, and then we worked with the graduate school, we're in our second year with the graduate school, undergraduate students, with really promising assessment results, um, you know, for faculty and staff, we had over 140 participate, and 88% felt they made, made movement with their goal. Um, in the UMass graduate school, the first year we had over 190 participate. 76% wanted partner matching, which was interesting information, you know, um, that that's a valuable piece of the program. 94% said they would recommend it to a friend and 90% plan to continue to use the framework. Um, 80% with their current partner and 10% with a new partner. So happy to answer, you know, questions that people have around that. And then um, for my very last piece, I'd like to invite everyone to just take out a sheet of paper and identify. So you identify that area, jot down two concrete things you'll do in the next week to move you forward in that area you identify. Bonus challenge will be to tell a colleague, a friend, a family member what they are and then follow up with them next week. But for now, just take one more minute and and at least identify them and maybe write them down because that visioning it is what helps us make the movement toward the areas. I love that, Molly. <laughs> I'm really just sitting here going, right. And it is those small things. And we think that it is uh, large things <laughs> transform. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. I'm going to stop share and invite if anyone has comments, questions, and then I'll turn it back to um, Tanya to offer the closing. I want to join you in the thank you um, and to thank you, Molly, for sharing with us and giving, giving what feels like and felt like, I don't know about anybody else, but I'll use myself as an example, um, a breath of like renewal in the middle of the day. And so thank you for that, Molly. Um, we do, please feel free to put any questions that you might have. Um, and we had a couple of folks who had to leave and they, they wanted to express their gratitude to you uh, for your share, Molly. Um, and I promised that I would talk a little bit about Leadership's programs. If you are not familiar with Leadership, um, we're at leadership.org and you can find out all kinds of great information there. Um, but we have a number of programs and growing literally by the day sometimes um, of leadership programs that serve into our mission and our vision uh, as 
as I talked about at the beginning of the hour. And so in, the Institute is a four day in, uh, Institute that is really um, building work around leading around values and integrity. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I like to think of it as the grandparent program that it has been around the longest. Um, and so it offers a lot of depth and insight. And then Catalyst um, is a day long program that is, I just facilitated one, all about really, you know, who do you want to be in the world and what kind of catalyst, you know, do you want to be in your own life and others? Resilience is just that opportunity to reflect on and build more resilience. And then of course, creative dialogue is that opportunity to um, practice some skills and learn some skills to have more courageous dialogues. We are so grateful um, and we are always wanting folks to know that they we are not for profit and that if you want to support our mission you can absolutely do that thank you all again um and we look forward to seeing you i think june is that correct abby that we're coming back with a full series uh week long um this was our special spotlight um but we'll see you again in june yeah, we don't have a date set for June, but we will indeed do um, a June week. Um, and we'll share this recording um, to this session out with everyone who registered for today's session as well. So um, if you wanted to share this maybe with a colleague that were like, I wanted to attend, but I wasn't able to, then now you can, you can send the recording to them. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks Thank so you much. so much, Molly. Thank you all. This is such a delight to be with you. Take good care.